This video is introducing a series I'm doing on mature economics. So this is really about how do you develop out your understanding of the economic tool set so that it's going to be flexible, so that it's able to respond to evidence, so that you can develop your own unique understanding of how the world works using the maps of economics, but letting those maps respond to reality. So that's what this series is going to do. And in this video, I want to lay out, first of all, what are the developmental stages? How do you think about that? And then how do do you go about maturing your understanding of economics after your first couple of economics courses? Um, we'll look at the reality sandwich. How do you go about listening to people in a flexible way? And that kind of flexibility is going to involve comfort with ambiguity. So seemingly opposite things like competition and cooperation, they're not as opposite as you may think, or a different way of thinking about that is that competition and cooperation, these cohere, they're intermeshed in a way that is kind of deep and profound. And same with selfishness versus altruistic behavior, these things are intermeshed. They may seem like opposites until you actually start to look at the reality of the fabric of human behavior. Another example is deliberative behavior. If you want to understand economic models, you need to understand that these models do not require deliberative choice. Even though in early econ classes, that's how, that's how you think of it because that's the easiest first approach. But it's not deliberative. It's also not not deliberative. So how do you think about the fact that it's neither one at once. And that's what I'll go over here. Actually, I won't go deep into any of those. I'll just introduce those concepts and a few more like them. And in other videos, I'll flesh those out. Okay, so let me go over this diagram that I've come up with for explaining developmental stages. And this is about pursuing truth. So the first thing to know is that the truth is kind of slippery and refuses to be caught. It's not like really advanced economists have grasped truth and they have it in their hands. It's more like they're kind of close to it. But if you look at advanced economists, they disagree with each other. They each have their own deep understanding, but it's unique to their perspective on the world, their personality, what they've observed in the world. And that's what makes the conversation juicy and exciting at the advanced stages is that everyone has their own perspective. So the way I'm going to uh, depict this is the truth kind of moves around and refuses to be caught by anyone whatsoever. That's my representation of the truth moving. And here we have an advanced economist, a sophomore, and an internet troll. And what annoys me to no ends is the people who say economists think everybody is selfish and fully rational. That is sort of said with a sneer and it's meant to look down their nose at people. That's what internet trolls do. And now one problem with that is that the word rationality actually changes as you advance your understanding of how the economics tool set works. Your, your understanding goes deeper, but the number of words you have to describe how you're thinking doesn't expand as much as you're thinking. So um, in any case, that's the internet troll. And the internet troll is not oriented toward the truth. The internet troll is not trying to understand how economics works or how people work. They're really oriented toward taking down the sophomore who believes the Econ 101 textbooks with the most basic understanding. And I want to be clear here, I am not looking down at sophomores. Going through the sophomore developmental stage is a good and healthy thing. I went through it. Everybody goes through it. As a matter of fact, even once you're advanced, you're still going to not have arrived. So there will still be ways that you're wrong and don't understand things. So my point here is that the troll is oriented toward taking down the sophomore, but the sophomore who's learning the basics, learning the scaffolding in the textbooks, is still oriented toward the truth. They're trying to move towards something that is not fully understandable, but better understandable with the scaffolding of the textbooks. And now we do notice that the advanced economist and the troll might both say something like, uh, this specific model in the textbook is wrong, but um, this advanced economist is still oriented toward the truth and their understanding of why that's wrong still appreciates the journey. So how do you go about maturing your understanding of economics? 
books, where the first step is learning this stuff in the textbook. It's okay for it to be really visualizable and concrete at that point. But I think a good way of thinking about the maturing process um, is a way that I got from this book, amazing book about the left hemisphere and right hemisphere of the brain. He goes really deep into the science and the philosophy. And basically the left hemisphere is the part of our brain that is more associated with building maps and with the symbolic. And of course, models, economic models are maps. The right hemisphere is capable of perceiving that which does not fit our preconceptions. So the right hemisphere, you can think of it as being able to perceive reality. Now, there's going to be some interaction here. Our reality is always filtered through a lens. Our lens comes from the maps. And of course, the right hemisphere and left hemisphere of the brain are both involved in everything we do. But the process of maturing your understanding of economics should involve a reality sandwich. That is, you look at reality, you, you're curious about reality, you're like, what's driving that person's behavior to do that? you're looking at reality, you develop your own intuitions based on your full experience, your embodied experience in life, and then you bring those realities to the map and you try to play with the realities you've observed within the context of economic models and see, can I build this in? How would this build in? How does it interact with other people's perception of the same situation? And then after you've done that, after you've played, then you bring uh, what you've built into your models back to reality to check it, to see actually is this way I've set up of understanding and perceiving the world, does it still map onto what I'm seeing? So the reality sandwich is really how you develop out your own unique way of thinking about economics. And your way will be unique because nobody has your personality and your character. Nobody has observed the same set of social relationships that you've observed, your life experience will very much play in with the whole history of reality that you have uh, that you have to pull from th in your intuitions. And so by doing this, you allow yourself to develop your own uh, variation on economics. And because each mature economist has their own variation, those conversations between economists with their different maps, those are really fruitful and juicy and fun because you're like, wait a second, my experience and the map I've developed is slightly different than yours. And maybe I can learn something from yours and pull from that if it seems to map onto my reality. And the interaction here is just really exciting and fun. And that leads us to the next tip for developing out your mature understanding of economics, which is to listen flexibly. And when someone's talking, you ask yourself, what is the smartest, most insightful way I could interpret what they're saying? Because if you take the trolls approach, oh, they must be saying the stupidest possible, most immoral possible version of what they could be saying, you will always hear that. Um, whereas if you're like, wait a second, could they be saying something that's really insightful. Um, for one, even if they are saying the stupid thing, you will have learned a lot by doing this exercise of trying to figure out the most insightful uh, interpretation of their work, of their model that they've built. But also, oftentimes you'll find, wait a second, they actually do think of it in the most insightful way. And the conversation goes way better when you uh, when you're exploring these ideas in a flexible way that understands it's actually hard to communicate and uh, how somebody is thinking about the world is not always super straightforward and that requires flexible listening. The next approach here is to develop a flexibility of thought. And this book has a chapter called Coincidence Oppositorum, which is the notion that oftentimes really deep truths, um, they're not binary. They, they may seem binary and a really immature understanding of those would make them binary. But in fact, opposites cohere. If you zoom in or zoom out at different levels, uh, this, this works at, at one level, but you zoom out and the opposite is true at a different level of understanding. So I think um, this really gets at why you might want your thoughts to be flexible. And here's some categories, uh, most of which, in fact, probably all of which I will do a separate video on in the series. But just to briefly go through some of these, um, ambiguously deliberative. When somebody, you're watching somebody and they're making a decision in the real world, they're doing something 
Are they deliberately thinking it through? And you wanna ask yourself, when are they being deliberative? When are they not? Maybe at one point in time it was deliberative, but now it's sort of built into their nervous system. And thinking of a lot of decision making comes from the gut rather than the brain. And the gut yet is informed by the brain. So ambiguous thinking about deliberative versus non-deliberative. Similarly, ambiguous thinking about selfish versus not selfish. And you can think of this as if somebody is doing something for their family, is that selfish? And you can kind of say, oh wait, it could be selfish and not selfish at the same time. And you can expand the family and think, okay, what about uh, your church, your, uh, your state, your country? What about your racial group? What about your, uh, your industry, your, your job? There's lots of different sort of in-groups that you could be uh, very generous to the people inside the in-group, but um, selfish for the in-group at the expense of an out-group. So, um, I'll go deeper into that in another video because this one actually goes really, really deep. But um, thinking about selfishness or about self-interest, which is usually the word that economists use, thinking about that really flexibly is helpful. And then good or bad, thinking ambiguously about good or bad, where every time you hear something where this seems like a really good thing to society, what are the side effects? What are the possible downstream effects that could actually make this wonderful, beautiful thing bad? And same with the reverse, something that's bad, are there also ways that it's good? And you're sort of developing an ability to think, mm, uh, think from many different angles. As I mentioned, competition and cooperation very much cohere. And if you study the classic game theory games, Battle of the Sexes, Prisoner's Dilemma, Game of Chicken, all of those, uh, that's a good place to go to start exploring why are these not opposites, or I will sometimes say they're not opposites, and that feels correct with for me. I think um, the fact opposites cohering is actually probably a better way of putting that. And then money is a secondary motive. Money definitely drives people, but it drives people because they care about the things money buys. They care about maybe security, maybe status, maybe supporting their family, supporting their community. Um, so people have many different possible drives behind uh, a drive for money. And going behind the screen and looking at all of those different drives is one way of complexifying your thought. And then um, the next bit here is to recognize that the language evolves as you develop a deeper understanding of economics. So rationality does not mean the same thing to people on the street as it does to mature economists. It does not mean the same thing in an Econ 101 course as it does to mature economists because textbooks have to lock down a definition. They have to use words to define what does this thing mean. And uh, the word itself is going to capture way more of reality and understanding once you've thought for many years on the topic than it, it will in that definition in the textbook. So definitions in textbooks hold loosely to those. Same thing with self-interest, it works kind of similarly. And you might think, why do we stick with the same word all throughout this developmental process and have it change meaning, that's really weird. And we actually do something slightly different with utility function versus objective function. In your sophomore classes, you're going to learn about utility functions, whereas that term tends to fade to the side and economists in the advanced stages use more objective function, which is kind of a broader category. It includes a profit maximization function. It includes uh, all kinds of things, but it's a more flexible term. So in this case, we actually let the language slightly evolve as you mature, but still it's the same process. Like a senior in college, their understanding of an objective function is going to be different than uh, somebody who's who has a PhD or whatnot. And one way of thinking about the language use in mature economics is to think that these words, they're a ballpark. They're a really broad, wide ballpark, where if somebody's talking about an objective function, that means they're talking about the things that drive a person, that motivate their behavior. They're, think th they're talking about impetus. They're talking about um, what is driving pursuit of something, all of that. But there are so many things that could drive a person. And so you have to know where are you in the ballpark? 
And to, to figure that out, you actually have to look at the context. What is this specific economist that you're talking to right now? How do they think about what is driving a person in the situation that they're talking about? So it's highly contextualized where the language just gets you into a ballpark and the specifics are determined by the conversation in the context. Now this series on mature economics will probably be long. It's going to be many videos because there's just so much here. But there's a problem I have, which is this stuff is not usually gotten through instruction. It's usually gotten by participating in the conversation with an open mind, building your own models and playing around with them and discovering things through the models as you compare the models with your real life and update the models. That's normally how it's done. And I actually think that is generally a better way. And as a matter of fact, I don't think you can get real understanding of this stuff just through instruction. In fact, the way I'm going to have to explain these things is me giving you another map that's a map of these things, but still you have to learn it through this interaction, this reality sandwich. And I'm going to do that anyway, because I think it's worthwhile, and I do think it will help you point the nose of your boat, like, where are you headed? Well, you don't want to end up exactly where I am, because you're a unique person and you need your own unique economics. Um, but I think me laying out the models of the way I think in an advanced stage might help you. And I have a video on my other channel that says something similar to what I said on this video. It's a little bit higher quality with images and it's responding to somebody who is an author who thinks economists think in a certain way that we don't. Um, so I'll link to that below, but this is just the introduction to the series.